Today is the big day, and we have already done two other videos literally just in preparation for this one. Our big tentpole topic, of course, is the seven heavens of Mount Celestia, but before we could even wrap our heads around this realm, we first needed to talk about its inhabitants, which of course are the Archons, which we did a video on, and then we had to talk about the purpose of the mountain and what people do in here, which was our last video. Now that we have done all of that, we can actually go ahead and talk about the locations within the mountain. Mountain. Today we're going to delve mega deep into each of the seven mountains. We will talk about the locations that you can find in there, we will talk about the gods and the realms, and we will explore some of the deepest secrets of the mountains that you probably have never heard from before. But before we do that, I would like to remind you guys of this really cool thing that I have created. I have made a PDF myself. I worked for a couple of months on piecing together as much information as I felt like you guys would need in order to not just run a draconic adventure, but also make the aftermath of a massive dragon encounter as easy as possible. See, what we're given in Dungeons and Dragons books, they help us figure out the motivations of dragons, you know, their abilities, their layers. I mean, you already know all that stuff, though. What you don't know is how to skin a dragon. How much of that leather you need for armor? What would happen if you make a dark sacrifice of a powerful draconic body in order to fuel your spells? What happens if you drink draconic blood? This is all stuff that we have knowledge of because it exists in older books, but they just don't give it to us now. There's actually a lot in the lore. I did a bunch of research and got you guys some really interesting stuff in here. We have interesting spells that dragons and draconic creatures can use. I got you guys magic items that you can either make with draconic parts or are designed to be used by dragons or against dragons. All this stuff that I'm talking about, you guys can find on the PDF. There's tons of stuff in here that I know that you guys are going to love. Plus, I designed some subclasses myself with a very strong draconic motif. Stuff that I felt like D&D needed. You know, barbarians with oversized weapons to kill dragons, rangers who specialize in mounted combat, which is frankly weird that we never got one of those, and of course a warlock who makes a pact with a powerful draconic being who can, through dark rituals, turn itself into a half-dragon. If you want access to this, click either the link in the description below or simply click on this uh, nifty little button here. It'll take you straight over into the shop. You cannot miss it. Just scroll down and you will see it. But now, back to the video. Mount Celestia has seven heavens, which colloquially people call seven mountains. In reality, it is just a, a single, unbelievably massive mountain that is separated into seven layers or seven sections. And you start on the first layer and you must climb the mountain in order to reach the other ones. One by one. One. Each layer is its own thing, with its own characteristics, its own powers, and its own group of different people which congregate within them. All of them, of course, beautiful and vibrant in their own way, so without further ado, let's begin. Lunia is the first layer of Mount Celestia and the place where every single person who enters this plane gets to start in. We've already covered most of it in our previous video, so I won't go too crazy on it, but basically this realm is the bottom of the mountain. The mountain itself is on a big island with harbor towns and beaches and a massive sea made out of fresh, holy water and tons of islands that dot that sea. Lunia is the closest layer to the astral and because of that it has been described as looking very similar to it. The sky is dark with a full moon and completely filled with beautiful stars that illuminate the realm. The sun never comes out here. Now, on the sea you can find vibrant communities of sea elves which live underwater alongside their celestial dolphins and celestial whales. And there's an entire new race of creature that can only be found here on Mount Celestia, which are the Soveri. They're basically kind of like a half-elf, half-octopus, and they effectively make it their job to try and make sure that people don't drown when they teleport into the plane. They will help you even if you're a devil or a demon. Now, some of the islands that dot the sea are massive and the constructions on them sometimes are just as big. It has been described that some of those fortresses on those islands can be literally miles long. But now, let's talk about one of the biggest towns that you can find in here. This is actually something that we did not mention on our last video. There's a town called Hearts Faith. Quote, Trust is everywhere, and a state of grace fills every street and tavern of the town. Robbery, duels, and rage are dispelled by the simple joys of Hearts Faith. Everywhere are window boxes, cobblestones, and sparkling fountains. Dogs do not growl. 
Children may whine and complain, but they never scream. And elders are respected. No one locks their doors or bars their windows, end quote. The town is built on a steep cliffside by the shore of the ocean. In fact, it was so close to the ocean that its central plaza was often flooded at high tide. Of course, it has a tremendously popular harbor which holds ships which would take people over into the other upper plains through magical portals found on the sea. A passage towards Bytopia or Elysium would cost you around 150 gold pieces, so generally pretty cheap. To the Beastlands and Arborea, it would cover you 500 gold pieces, and then all the way to Isgard would be a whooping two grand. Uh, generally speaking, though, the, the leaders of the town would try and, of course, dissuade people from leaving. Remember that the goal, of course, is to promote planners to take on the spiritual path up the mountain, not to send them away. Now, in towns like these, you would see a lot of people that would sell holy water, of course, as you can imagine, but also any equipment that you would need in order to actually go up and hike the mountain, including cold weather gear that you would most definitely need. I should mention uh, that there are seasons even up in here in heaven, which are regulated by some of the higher ranked archons on the area. They basically get to decide what it is going to be, but they keep it, of course, orderly since this is a lawful plane after all. And just because it is heaven, also remember that you can still suffer and die. Keep that in mind. You need to get your gear and be ready for anything. Without physical toil, how could you even expect to perfect yourself? Now, we've already done too much on Lunia, so we're going to move on to Mercuria, the Golden Heaven. This heaven is described as being a heaven of, well, mountains. The place is filled with very large mountains, though instead of having peaks, they instead form plateaus at the top, where most of the cities are actually located. The lore states that the air here is very thin, which takes some getting used to, but this very thin air makes the body giddy and tingly. The most interesting sights within this heaven are the massive mausoleums that lay in here, where the celestials inter their saints and their soldiers. It is a very important location because of that, and they celebrate their dead through an annual remembrance called called the Day of Memory, where they have a fantastic day filled with feasts. Mercuria also happens to be the place where the armies of Mount Celestia would muster in the case of an attack, and so it is also known as the Armory of the Mountain, where presumably many of the legendary weapons and armors are stored for the purposes of, you know, any divine war. The whole heaven here is actually suffused with a golden light coming from the sky, which grants the mountain the moniker of the Golden Heaven. Now, one of the most interesting locations within Mercuria, and you're gonna love this, is the roaming castle of Bahamut, the god of dragons. I do want to stress this though, Bahamut does not live in a realm inside of the mountain. He, he lives in the actual Mercuria on his floating keep. Many of the gods that you will see in this mountain will have their own sort of separated realm that is very distinct from the mountain, but that is not the case with Bahamut. He lives in the actual thing. So you can just find him and see him going around. Now the keep is called Bahamut's Palace and it is described as a glittering wonder that is built entirely of a hilariously enormous treasure hoard. It has windows of gemstones, settings of gold and silver, walls of inlaid copper and ivory, the floors of beaten mithril. It's amazing. Now what makes this place even more interesting is that it is never in the same place since it travels on a massive howling whirlwind. But the cool thing about that is that this palace is virtually the only thing in the mountain that can freely travel within the different heavens of the mountain. The palace is said to, in fact, exist simultaneously on the first four heavens of Mount Celestia. And nobody actually knows how Bahamut does this. In fact, the lore even describes it that not even the gods know how he does this, because it breaks all the known rules of the mountain. That being said, many of the gold dragons that live within the keep do their best to help pilgrims hide up the mountain in the normal way, and some, well, the abnormal way. See, Bahamut's palace appears to be the only shortcut that exists in Mount Celestia, a way for a person to skip many of the layers. The floating palace has access to portals that connect all of the first four layers, so technically, provided that you give Bahamut a proper tribute of treasure, he might just let you take one of those portals. Though keep in mind that even though this might help you to shortcut yourself all the way up into the fourth layer, Good luck actually reaching spiritual enlightenment this way, and good luck trying to reach any of the higher heavens. Shortcuts are not the way to do this. Venia, the pearly heaven. 
This heaven gets its moniker from what is described as a nacreous glow coming from the sky, which sounds like a bad word, but it means white and iridescent. So it gets like a, a pearly colored shine that illuminates everything. The mountains in here are rounded with rarely ever a spot that does not possess green and luscious forests. You will find tons of meadows and wildernesses that seem to teem with beautiful, vibrant greens. Uh, one of the most interesting sights within Venia is the fabled glass tarn. So a, a tarn is basically a massive mountain lake, and this one is supposed to be just about half frozen by the icy tops of the tall mountains. Uh, this particular tarn is fabled because it is divinely enchanted, and most of the properties are still to be discovered. It is believed that deep within it lies many portals that lead out of the heaven and into other planes of reality, like a one-way trip into the astral, to the plane of water, or to any other watery places around the multiverse. And no one has been able to fully explore the deepness of the lake and chart the location of this portal, so most of it is just unknown. But the really interesting thing about this particular lake is that it is a holy place of pilgrimage because of its potent divination powers. As a pilgrim, you are supposed to offer the lake a tribute, after which a beautiful light will start shining from the deepest recesses of the lake. The light will travel upwards towards the shore until it reaches you. If you are worthy, then the light will grant you a divine vision. But if you're not, then the light will turn out to be a sword archon whose task would be then to scold you and chase you away. So yeah, people come in here to experience powerful prophecies, clairvoyances, and, and mystic trances. Of course, an incredibly pivotal location to explore if the path to enlightenment that you chose in order to climb the mountain was one of knowledge and study. Now, one of the most powerful godly pantheons in Dungeons and Dragons is set within Venia, the Green Fields, which you should recognize because, well, that is the heaven of the halflings. The whole philosophy of the Green Fields is, quote, Life is a series of small comforts, and hospitality is the greatest duty of any civilized creature. Defense of hearth and home is the only worthwhile cause for war, and a sensible cotter don't go wandering the countryside. She stays at home and tends to her garden and her obligations. Mind what the neighbors say." End quote. The domain is a combination of borrowed households and small rustic buildings, just how you would know them to be. But it is said that only the faithful can ever find the entrance that leads into the green fields, and those who find themselves there never return. Well, because it is just that awesome. It is described that the place is just so warm and welcoming and, and filled with such comfort that nobody ever really wants to leave. Quote, Greenfields has no single dominating town, though it is well settled with many villages, hedgerows, busy windmills, and small garden plots. The largest and best kept settlements are Candlewood, Marston on Water, Thistledowns, Amberwell, Turtle Creek, and Bonberry Hills. All of them are much alike, though they are fiercely proud of their differences. Each is built around a central square surrounding a huge and ancient tree, each tree being of a different species, a sort of mascot for the town." End quote. Now, the interesting bit about this realm, which you don't see anywhere else, is the halfling rule of eye for an eye. Anyone that harms a petitioner of the halfling pantheon within this realm suffers in proportion to the injury done to the innocent. Quote, Wounds are identical, and any that kills a halfling petitioner instantly suffers Yondala's wrath, losing youth and vigor rapidly until the evildoer is a mere husk. Then, dust." End quote. Keep in mind that the rules of Mount Celestia are a bit different than the rules of some of the lower planes. A spirit or a petitioner that dies on Mount Celestia does not die for real. They only die permanently if they die outside of the realm, which of course is the opposite from, you know, devils and demons. Though this is a very specific thing from Mount Celestia that does not necessarily apply to any of the other upper planes. So, as a petitioner, dying in here, not a big deal. Now, one thing that you will find amusing is that the Greenfields is the inventor of the cards of holding, which are just like normal wagon cards or simple ox-driven cards that are enchanted with being able to carry up to 4,000 pounds of material that it weighs only a tenth of its normal weight. The place is also known throughout the multiverse as the place for food, teas, tobaccos, and clothing. They also have excellent mineral springs. Also, Yundala, one of the most powerful gods in the multiverse, so do not mess with her. She slaps. Solania, the Electrum Heaven. 
Now, so far, you know, we have enjoyed some, some beautiful vistas, some crazy awesome locations, and just generally some good vibes. And so, uh, coming from the Green Hills into this uh, might give you a bit of a whiplash. So, Lania is heavy mountain ranges all over the place, but these mountains are filled with fog and mists. The mountains are hard to climb, with many treacherous passages filled to the brim with ice peaks, tons of impassable knee-deep mud trenches, tons of deadly avalanches and rock slides, that will kill you in an instant and the worst of all no end in sight for any pilgrim who wishes to pass on to the next heaven see we talked about this in our last video that well this is the place where most pilgrims tend to stay at for the longest described as the mountain with the highest giving up percentages of all because of the strong eyes that forms on these extremely tall mountains most of the passages and trails are completely shut down throughout most of the year with snow and ice and so Typically, you can only pass during the very short period of spring and summer. However, the big reward is that these mountains are shock full of valuable minerals and gems, which makes this place a particular favorite to dwarves. And somebody even goes so far as to say this is the dwarf heaven, which is both a subjective comment and an objective reality, since the actual dwarf heaven is also here. The dwarvish pantheon, also called the uh, Mordin Salmon, has a realm in Solania called Arachinor. Uh, this is typically where Muradin and Berenar live. Quote, Moradin lives within a vast mountain, the dark of which not even other deities know. Dwarf petitioners speak in hushed tones of the stonework and craftsmanship within Moradin's home, which far surpasses anything that they could ever hope to make. When the forge is in use, the rush of his bellows roars like a dragon's fire. End quote. Now, this peculiar realm is interesting because it is, by itself, kind of a realm in the sense that Moradin can manipulate it and control it, but it is also directly a part of Solania itself. See, let me explain this further. See, Bahamut is special because he just chooses to live outside in the mountain like any other person would. He just moves around the mountain as he desires. Uh, Moradin and his pantheon are also unique, but for a different reason. He has somehow taken a part of the mountain and claimed dominion over it, which no other god has been able to do. Gods just create their own realm within the mountain. This is different. Many godly realms are separated from the layer in which they are housed, but Arachinor is basically the entirety of the underground of Solania. Uh, the realm is a massive interconnected series of tunnels and cities that exist under the realm. And think of it as the under dark of this heaven, except extremely beautiful with impossibly impeccable works of stone masonry. Now, the special feature of all of Solania is that the art of creation is enhanced in here. Anything that you create or craft with magic is empowered, so in terms of effect, you could craft things twice as fast or create twice as many of whatever it is that you're doing, and the stuff that you create will last for twice as long. And this, however, does not take into consideration the art of enchanting, since you're, well, not really creating something as much as you're simply improving something. Now what this creates is a heaven where almost any construction of stone, metal, or cut gemstones are available here for far far less than anywhere else probably on the multiverse. And it is not just cheap of course, it is also impeccably made by the master smiths of the area. The dwarves in here however will not sell their best stuff to planner travelers, they reserve that for the archons and the other petitioners. Uh, the caveat to this place though is that cloth is extremely rare and typically about five times the price, and you would probably have to go back to the green fields in order to get some of that good cloth. Now there's of course tons that we could talk about in the heavens of the dwarves, but we don't really have that much time to delve in here. <laughs> See, that was, uh, that, was, uh, that was a pun. Anyways, the most important thing that you absolutely must know is that Arachinor is the location of the fabled Soul Forge, which is a mythical forge from which the dwarves were originally created. Quote, The dwarf theologist stated with some conviction that it is the heart of the Soul Forge with which Moradin tempers the spirits of his people and their weapons that provides the warmth for this layer of the heavens. The chant is that the smoke from his foundry becomes the mist that hangs in the veils. Moradin and Berenar are served by dwarf petitioners similar to those in Klangagon's host, with the exception that their intended purpose is not battle, but building and forging and testing and bettering the race of dwarves. The Soul Forge is the birthplace of the dwarves, where their seven fathers were forged and where Muradin breeds life into each dwarf. 
Some believe that it is also where petitioners return to oneness with the plane. The chant is the forge appears in dreams to those who are chosen to serve the Dwarf Father." End quote. The forge itself is described as being a massive towering block of mithril about 40 feet tall conjoined with a pool of molten soul fire and then a full wall of pure eyes. Moradin is typically found here by the Soul Forge where he oversees the creation of dwarves and then the subsequent delivery of those newly created dwarf spirits into the prime material realm where they are meant to be born. So effectively, the Soul Forge doubles as a dwarf creator and a portal into the impossibly large number of worlds in the multiverse. Through this forge, Moradin can send dwarves into any world he desires, but further, and I find this very interesting, the lore actually states that Moradin can turn normal creatures into dwarves by effectively reshaping them through the forge. Now, any dwarf can actually use the anvil, but of course, its divine properties are reserved solely for Muradin. When Muradin is not present, there's typically a long line of very influential smiths who sign up for the usage of the forge for enchanting or crafting purposes, and this is totally normal. Uh, Moradin loves to exemplify the notion that you should always be working and creating, and so he doesn't hoard the legendary Soul Forge just for himself, and in fact, lets others use it. Its main philosophy is, quote, ceaseless toil and labors the only fit occupation for a worthy soul. Fire tempers spirits, and work brings wisdom. Seek to forge strength within, and the need for outer strength will vanish, end quote. Mertion, the Platinum Heaven. Coming from Selenia, this place will be a wonder because you don't have to deal with sharp peaks or terrible cold any longer. Instead, you're welcomed by the beautiful silver sky that burns bright, combined with gorgeous sweeping plains dominated by huge imposing citadels. See, Mertion is the marshalling grounds for all manner of paladins, sword, archons, divas, and any kind of servant of good and law who wishes to train. If you ever wondered where you would ever need it to go in order to, you you know, sign into the armies of the heavens alongside other angels and archons in order to fight against evil, then this would be the place. Many of the citadels built here are built right beside portals that lead into all kinds of front lines all across the multiverse. Uh, one of the first towns that you would find as you enter this mountain would be Empyria, the city of tempered souls, a city famous for its incredible healing properties. In here, you could find ways to restore anything that you have lost, from eyesight to body parts to even aging that has been forcefully taken from you. Uh, because of the harsh conditions of Solania, this place exists to give those who have passed through a chance at respite and rest. Quote, In addition to its doctors and healing waters, Empyria is known for public baths, excellent trail rations, and climbing gear. End quote. Out of all of the training grounds, the biggest is probably Arvina, which is where celestials gather when they want to make fighting their whole business. Uh, the place is filled with these enormous massive bells that chime every once in a while, dictating the passage of time for those that train in here, since, well, for those who toil here, keeping track is very important. See, you arise before the dawn for prayers and breakfast. You work and train all day, then feast and pray once more before you collapse in exhaustion. That is the life for every single person who resides in here. There is no rest for the armies of darkness that grow ever so stronger. The bells dictate when each part of the day ends and begins. There's also an enormous keep in here that keeps track of all of the exploits of many of the archons and proxies that reside in Mount Celestia, and this is where people would come and see how far people have gone in their quest for self-perfection. See, if you ever wanted to go and find information about a hero of the mountain or a hero of legend for the team of good, then this would be the place where you would go and find that out. There's a couple of other interesting locations in here, like for example, Renfa, the city of the sands of time. This place is a great mystery because apparently time functions odd in here. You might experience a pleasant summer, but then a spring and then a winter and then autumn and then back to spring. Things are just kind of a little bit odd in here. See, the, the place is ruled by a solar, which is, by the way, very, very rare. Solars are rarely just like chilling like this, but he has been tasked by the forces of good to guard this place as a location of great importance. The solar, whose name is Donathiel, doesn't even understand why, and he thinks that he could be put to better use, but, you know, here he is anyhow. 
Now this city is kind of sick. There's a Secundus that lives in here, a rogue Modron. This is huge, by the way. I'm not sure how to pronounce it either. A Secundus Modron is basically as far as you can get as a Modron without turning into a Primus, which is the leader of all Modrons. And this guy would have been in control of basically a quarter of all of Mechanus, but instead he became rogue and now lives here. Apparently because he's experimenting on creating a bit of chaos in order to study it, which is of course heretic to Modrons. All he does is he will occasionally throw things into confusion briefly, nothing too major, but then he studies people's reactions to being confused at the commotion. Doesn't sound too major, but that was enough to kick what is essentially one of the four leaders of Mechanus away from the whole plane, which is kind of funny. In any case, the Modron has constructed a portal into the demiplane of time here in the city, so if you ever wanted to visit that, well, there you go. There are also Archons in here who can tell you how long you have left to live. They study you and then give you clocks that show you how much time you have left in your life. They say that they do it in hopes that when people see how short their lives truly are, it, it tends to make people want to repent and seek enlightenment sooner, which is why they do it. But yeah, the whole city is just kind of like a weird mystery. And like I said before, there are many citadels and many cities in here, many of which double up as fortresses for the armies of good. But one of the most famous one is Soket Hezi, the City of Swords. Quote, the City of Swords prides itself on preparedness, valor, and supreme martial organization. As a result, it boasts no fewer than four extensive walls, each guarded by its own gates and farmed into productive terraces, before reaching the city proper." End quote. It is said that there are over 1,000 sword archons in here that lead over 7,777 warden archons. Now, these are heralded by trumpet archons who warn enemies of their impending doom. Now, when you hear the term a thousand sword archons as a single military unit, those numbers might seem a little bit low, but remember that you can't really compare this to humans. A single sword archon could kill easily dozens or hundreds of humans. To put it into perspective, we, we covered the city of Brass on a previous episode where we talked about the armies of the Sultan who basically controls most of the plane of fire. His biggest army of common soldiers was about 100,000 with about 25,000 archers to support them. The numbers in general are lower than what you would expect for multi-planner warfare, but that's because each of these guys are the top dogs. Each of those 100,000 of the Sultan's army is a pure blood Ifriti. You know, devils are not just gonna randomly throw at you an army of, say, you know, 20,000 Irinis. Like, that's insane. In the same way as 20,000 Divas would just be completely insane. I mean, it can happen. Like like I said, the uh, Ifriti Sultan has an army like that, but that's not what you would find in a single fortress city. Uh, the city of Brass is also a bit special too, so we shouldn't really count that anyways. A normal Ifriti fortress in the Plain of Fire, for example, houses about a thousand Ifriti to give you an idea. So yeah, anyways, having almost 10,000 high-powered planner archons in a single fortress city is kind of an enormous deal. And these guys are apparently hotshots too, since they have invaded Mechanus, Acheron, and the Nine Hells a few times. And you can actually find a few famous artifacts in the city that they have taken from other planes. Now you might be wondering, if all around what you can see is endless planes and citadels, then how do you climb to the next mountain? I mean, there must be something to climb up to, right? Well, yep, though it is very bizarre. See, the Lord describes parts of the plains of Mercion to be filled with these bizarre-looking black domes. Like, like, literally just enormous, completely round black orbs. Nobody knows what they are or where they came from, but to get to the next mountain, you're supposed to climb them. Uh, some of them even have stairs that have been etched into them by travelers over the eons. While others have these enormous footprints marked into them, which leads people to believe that the gods originally must have climbed them as well to get above. Uh, some of these orbs are so huge that they have trees growing in them and everything. Jovar, the glittering heaven. Now starting from here, the information gets a bit dry. We don't really have that much on these mountains here because, well, not many get to make it here. Or should I say, I mean, of course, throughout the eons, many have made it here. I mean, the multiverse is, you know, 
close to infinite when you think about it. So yeah, there are countless Archons and Planar Travelers that make it this far in Mount Celestia, but consider that those that make it here probably don't want to leave. If you are so illuminated and have reached the, the levels of enlightenment required to make it here, you probably don't want to go back to Waterdeep to spread the news of how it looks like. You also probably don't want to keep exploring the mountain and instead try and find a way to reach the end. For this and many reasons, the mountain is a big enigma, but this is what we know. Jovar is called the Glittering Heaven because everything is encrusted in beautiful gems of all kinds of colors. I mean like literally the floors, the, the hills, the, the trees, the mountains, it's all just encrusted with billions of crystals and radiant gems. It is said too that there really isn't a sky either, that there is a ceiling far up ahead that is also encrusted in gems. The whole layer is described as being something of a large, you know, kind of like a celestial vault. The main location of the mountains is Jetsaira, the heavenly city, which you can literally see from any location within the mountain because of how shiny it is. Quote, Visible from a hundred miles away, the sparkling lights of the heavenly city never dim. The city is a seven-layered cigarette. An enormous staircase on each of its four faces connects the layers, which are called terraces. The seventh terrace is the lowest layer. Yet Cyrus' tiniest details are fashioned for a purpose. Each stone is perfect. Each construction somehow so complete, it seems eternal." End quote. The cigarette is the last thing, the very last thing before you reach the end. For the entrance into the seventh mountain of Mount Celestia lies at the top. Quote, on the lowest terrace sits the Exchequer of Souls, a black marble building of graceful arches and onion domes laced with threads of gold and silver. Here, powerful Archons weight the virtues of lower Archons, elevating the worthy to higher forms. The radiant arsenal on the fourth terrace is a long, narrow building with a vaulted ceiling and extensive cellars. Here, weapons both magic and mundane are stored to arm the Arkan hosts if necessary. The most important weapons are said to contain the essence of powerful Archons. They reside in pearl-lined vaults sealed by deity-scribed glyphs. The bridge of Alsa Hall on the seventh highest terrace is a beam of blinding light. This is the portal to the seventh heaven. Cronius, and it is guarded by a solar named Zerona, who turns aside the unworthy." End quote. The heavenly city is protected by 12,000 sword archons alongside a powerful solar named Arithiel. This city is filled with an uncountable number of archons and travelers who are trying their best to reach the last mountain, and nobody really knows what it is to be found at the end, which of course is Cronius, the illuminated heaven. I hope that I'm not disappointing you when I say this, and, and I'm not trying to be dramatic here either. But the sad thing is that actually, well, nobody knows what's in here. And those that find this place never come back. The only entity on record in the multiverse that has ever come back would be Safkiel. I'm not actually even sure if any of the gods have actually seen the tip of this mountain either, since the lore states that they don't know what Safkiel is up to in here, something that Safkiel itself is an avatar of the seventh mountain. Uh, the common story that Archons and Gods will tell you is that when you reach the tip of the mountain, you then become part of the mountain, but that's, that's it, that's like all we know. Casters who cast divination magic are told that it is a place of pure joy and oneness with the Gods, a place where sorrow cannot enter, a place to leave bards speechless and sages sightless. But those divination spells would be fueled to the casters by their gods or other sources that might not even know themselves what's in there. The truth of the tip of the mountain will probably never be known. Who really is Safkiel? What does he do in there? And why even the gods cannot gaze upon this heaven? Remember, this mountain is older than the gods. They're powerless against it. They can't see in it. They might not even be able to get in it, and we will never know the truth of the matter. 
All right, guys, thank you so much for watching. Uh, make sure to check out the PDF that I created. The, the link should be right there in the description, or you can just scroll down and you should be able to see that little icon with the dragon's face. You can just click on that and it'll take you directly over into the shop. Um, when you buy the PDF on the shop, they'll send you an email with the PDF and, and you can download it through that email. So, of course, um, you know, it's something that I created myself. I'm, I'm really proud of it. I'm really happy with it. Uh, so if you guys haven't checked it, of course, I would implore you to try and, and see it. I, I'm really happy with it really proud so it would mean a lot to me i would like to also personally thank my patron supporters barry mascant 5e magic shop morgan johnson rusty rain doc feeder the great codini omega scales terry culp benjamin bosters falky 951 or dorix abim kurshap solarensis thomas hunt nathan mccomb soulless rider lost crusaders stalia olaf kleb jd green treb 909 tony rc famine 52 george fotlin sovereign mind trevor hess nathan rashura the living guild pack brian camp Chad Aga, John the Wicked, Shane and Sam Skinner, Steven Streblo, Describe, Herbert Johnson, The Wizard's Vault, James the Perverted, Shoddy Cats, Horrorbound, Jesse Feliciano, Munch Mania, and Varric for supporting me on Patreon at the $25 level. If you would like to support me as well, then please head on over to patreon.com slash Mr. Rex to support. Thank you guys for watching, thank you guys for being here, and I will see you all next time.